having a mailbag episode today where I answer all of your guys' questions. But before we get into those questions, I think we got to have a conversation about Marvin Bagley, his free agency, and his potential future with the Detroit Pistons. We'll talk about that in today's episode of the Lockdown Pistons Podcast. You are Locked On Pistons, your daily Detroit Pistons podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's the deal? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Pistons Podcast. Per usual, I'm your host, Kuka Hill. You can find me over on Twitter, at Kuka Hill. I want to thank you guys for making Locked On Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. And if you haven't already, or if you're one of the 50% of people who are watching this on YouTube and haven't hit that subscribe button, what are you waiting for? Head to the YouTube channel at Locked On Pistons. Hit that subscribe button. It's the best way to support the podcast. I'd really appreciate it. On the road to 3,000 subscribers. So, again, I'd really appreciate it. Hit that subscribe button over at the Locked On Pistons YouTube channel. So, today's episode, we're going to be answering all the questions that you guys sent in. Um, we didn't get an episode last Thursday, so I give you guys – a mailback episode this weekend. Uh, we should be back to normal scheduling this week. Um, but wanted to give you guys a, an extra episode this weekend. So we'll answer all of you guys' questions. But first, I, I really want to talk about Marvin Bagley. And over the weekend, I saw a lot of talk about Marvin Bagley within the Pistons community, what they think of him moving forward, what some people think his role is moving forward, how much he should be paid, how important is he, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that, that kind of has me I, – I, I just want to come on here and talk about him real quick. So I, I want to say first, he is he's, he was a really nice piece for the Pistons when he got traded to the Pistons midway through the season. Having a lob threat changed everything for the Pistons. I had been begging for a lob threat all season, all previous offseason. I'm still begging for one right now. Having a lob threat will unlock the Pistons offense, a vertical lob threat, inside presence. They desperately need it. I think it's the number one need for the Pistons this offseason. I know some people go off guard, a score at the wing. I still think it's an interior presence at the center position. So I, I want to give Marvin Bagley a ton of props because he is he was a really good addition for the Pistons at the at the uh trade deadline. Okay. So not taking any of that away from him. And K definitely formed a really good chemistry with him second half of the season or after the offside break. And it helped the Pistons play much better basketball, closer to 500 basketball than they had been at any other point during the season. However, I think everyone needs to calm down with Marvin Bagley. I think what the addition of Marvin Bagley should have showed people is not what people are pulling away from his time so far in Detroit. Now, I'm not saying that the Pistons, at no point, I know how this is going to go. At no point am I trying to suggest that the Pistons shouldn't resign Marvin Bagley. I'm fine with resign Marvin Bagley. I think they should. I think he's a nice backup piece. I think he could be a nice sixth man, quick score, active on the glass, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, don't have, I, I think they should resign him as long as it's relatively in his, you know, cheap in his ballpark. Uh, then go ahead. I, this is not me trying to say they shouldn't resign him. I just think that Pistons fans need to re reevaluate how they're thinking of him. So I think what people should be pulling away from his time last season in Detroit is not that Marvin Bagley is a great player, not that he's some tremendous player, not that he's like the future starter and who the Pistons need starting because it looks so much better with him on the floor at, on offensively after the all-star break. I think what people should be pulling away is a guy like Marvin Bagley who very much struggles defensively, like extremely so to the point it hurts the team tremendously, was still able to make a difference on the team simply because he provided a vertical threat. And what I mean by that is a lot of people should be pulling away that, heck, we got Marvin Bagley and all we need was one dude. All we need was a guy like Marvin Bagley to catch lobs and be a vertical threat. And look how big that changed the offense. Imagine if we had someone who was able to do more than that, but also be a lob threat and also be okay on defense. Imagine how good this team would be then. That should be the poll. That, that, that should be what team everyone took away from when Marvin Bagley was on the team last year and how he played. Now, again, we talked about multiple times in the podcast how well Marvin Bagley played, how, how much his dunks increased 
just when he came to the Pistons, how well he was shooting from zero to three feet, how many more looks he was getting from zero to three feet, how they were using him tremendously, how they were using him in the dunker spot, pick and roll, lob threat, all those kind of things, cutting to the basket along the baseline, all those things. He was a nice fit, great fit. Now, again, I'm saying I would be okay with the Pistons resigning him. I think he would be a good resign. However, I've seen a lot of people talk about him possibly being a starter in the future, possibly being a star in the future. He was the answer for the Pistons' problems. He should start over Isaiah Stewart. He should be, you know, in the lineup. I, I think people need to understand that while Marvin Bagley, yes, provided a lot that he seriously, and I want to say this nicely somewhat. I don't really know how to say this nicely, but he is he struggles mightily on the defensive end. Like bad. He's he's really bad on the defensive end. And it's tough to envision how you can build a team or have a team around him at the big man position with how bad he is defensively. Switching, teams do very well when he switches out on the perimeter. He doesn't move his feet like that and is not aware enough and doesn't have the kind of defensive IQ to, that he's shown so far to run drop coverage. And along with that, I, I don't know if you really trust him blitzing on or playing hard or, or showing on screens like that. I don't know if the Pistons want that to be their main defensive strategy. Anyways, it's hard to envision him being able to play heavy minutes on a real good team because of how badly he is on defense, uh, how bad he is on that end. And offensively, he still his outside shot is not that good. He needs to improve that a lot. Simply being a lap threat won't be enough to be a starter or to be like the future for the Pistons at the big man position. I think everyone needs to temper their expectations with that. That he's not that's not what he is. He is a nice piece off the bench, possibly fill in as a starter when guys go down and be all right. He would provide a lot a quick scoring punch off the bench, a spark plug. And I think that would be a really good role for him, for him moving forward. If he improves and gets to the point defensively, which I'm telling you, it's just really hard to see him getting there because of how far he is defensively. But if he can get to a point where he can be like a passable defender, then I could entertain this somewhat. But really what people should be pulling away from this time in Detroit is that, look, we were able to just grab a guy who could finish lobs. He's not good on defense. He doesn't provide spacing, but he's good at lobs. And look how much better we look. Imagine if the Pistons got a guy who was good at lobs, but also could post up, who also could shoot a midi or spreads the floor, or could also play defense and not be a bad defender. Imagine how good Detroit would be then. That should be the goal right there. That's what everyone should see. So uh, that's, that's all I wanted to get out the way with Marvin Bagley. Again, I want to reiterate I want the Pistons to resign Marvin Bagley. I think he's a good piece off the bench moving forward. Do not twist these words. I'm just saying that I feel like what I'm seeing from the community, the expectations need to be tempered. People should be looking at his time in Detroit in a different perspective than they are right now. Let me know in the comment section down below what you're thinking about that. Do you guys agree, disagree with me? What's your thoughts on Marvin Bagley moving forward? Should the Pistons resign him? Should they not? Let me know all that in the comment section down below or over on Twitter at Kuka Hill. When we come back, I'll start answering all of you guys' questions that you guys sent in to me on Twitter at Kuka Hill for this mailbag. If you guys want to appear on next week's mailbag, again, simply tweet me at Kuka Hill, put hashtag mailbag, or you can comment on one of the YouTube videos. Make sure you put hashtag mailbag so I can see it and know you're asking a question for the mailbag. And hopefully you'll appear on next week's episode. But before we get into any of those questions, I'll tell you guys about one of our sponsors, Rock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock all the parts that you need. Why are often pointless and seemingly intimidating questioning, like is your Odyssey an LX, and wait while the person behind the counter orders the parts on their computer, choosing the only brand that their warehouse happens to carry. You have computers with access to rockauto.com at home or in your pocket on your phone. You can save time and money when using Rock Auto. Why choose to spend 30%, 50%, even 100% more for the same parts from a chain store or a car dealership? For example, a Honda Odyssey fuel pump is $353 from a chain store, but $216 from Rock Auto. Rock Auto prices are reliably low for every customer. And they have everything you could possibly need. Brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even a new carpet. Go explore their easy-to-use website today to find the solution to your auto part needs. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, locked on in their how did you hear about us box they know that we sent you. 
Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. RockAuto.com. So, Oman, thank you guys again for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. And if you haven't already, head to our YouTube channel at Lockdown Pistons. Hit that subscribe button. It's the best way to support the podcast. And I would really appreciate it. So, again, Lockdown Pistons YouTube channel. Hit that subscribe button. All right. Let's answer some of the questions that you guys sent in for this week's mailbag. Again, if you want to be on a mailbag episode, you can either follow me on Twitter at Kuka Hill and tweet me, hashtag mailbag a question, or you can comment in the comment section down below, put hashtag mailbag, ask the question, and I'll be sure to try to get to it at some point on next week's episode. All right, this one is from Brady Grenier. He says, how dependent on the draft pick is the push for Aiden? I believe the what you're asking here, this question, the way you word it kind of confused me, but I believe what you're asking is, is is the who the Pistons pick with their draft pick, is that going to determine whether or not they push for Aiden? And if that's your question, I don't think the draft pick will have actually, you know what? I, I don't think it's going to impact it whether they move for Aiden. If they want Aiden, I think whoever they draft, it doesn't matter, they're gonna go after Aiden. However, we've talked about it on the podcast a few times recently that I believe if they get Shaden Sharp, like let's say they draft Shaden Sharp number five and Shane Sharp and, and Troy Weaver comes with this evaluation as well. From what I'm hearing from people, that's a lot of people, even though we had last week Mavs draft Richard Stamen on the podcast and he said he did not believe that, that Shane Sharp was as big as a project as people think. A lot of people do think so. So if you do draft him and Troy Weaver comes to that same evaluation I would be fine with the Pistons. I actually would encourage them to kind of punt this offseason uh, into free agency for like big fish uh, fishing. Not go after big fishes. Just, you know, replace some of the team option guys. Get some other guys to take some chances on. Refill the roster with like the seven, eight, nine guys. Come back next year. Trade Jeremy for like number seven if you can. Or trade Jeremy for number 12. Come back with a young team. Give these guys another year to develop. Sadiq, Cade, Isaiah, Killian. Shane Sharp, and let him play in the G League if he has to. Develop down there. Bring him up when he's ready. Try to develop him then. And develop some of these guys who take a chance on also in the offseason. And then come back next year ready to splurge. Come back next year with a better idea of your team. And now your team your, your team full of young guys have another year under their belt. And a guy who you just drafted at number five, Shane Sharp, isn't under the kind of expectations or pressure to contribute right away. I feel like if the Pistons go out this offseason, like, this is all dependent on only the Shane Sharp pick. If they pick Shaden Sharp and then they go out in the free agency and start like making a bunch of big signings that suggest that they're trying to push for a play in a playoff spot at this point, I feel like a lot of expectations will be put on Shaden Sharp. Fans won't be really happy with him sitting out or sitting in the G League. If he's not good out the gate and he needs time to develop, I don't feel like people would want to give him time to develop because they've signed people that suggest they want to go for a play in. You can't go for you know playoffs play in trying to win and also deal with a guy not playing well and try and develop him. So that's the only one where I would, me personally, I would second guess going after A and anybody else. But any other pick, I don't think that it's going to, you know, make much of an impact on whether they get Aiden. If they want to go after DeAndre Aiden, whoever they pick, they're going to go after DeAndre Aiden. It doesn't change it. That's that's the way at least I'm looking at it. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, next one, this one is from Chris Mikesell. It says, who would you trade Jamie Grant in 5-4 if that's the route the Pistons would want to go? So, the trade that I've been seeing floating around a lot with Jeremy Grant and five is if you can move up to four with the Kings, get four and like Rashawn Holmes. And the only way I even entertain that, and I don't even know if I accept it anyways, but the only way I entertain that is if either Chet Holmgren, Jabari Smith, or Paolo Bencaro fall to four. If one of those top three guys fall to four, then I think the Pistons should be interested in possibly moving up. Doesn't mean I think they should do it. I think then you entertain it. You definitely engage in those conversations, I feel like, and see if it would make sense. Are you high enough? It depends on how the Pistons, how high they are on one of those prospects. If they're really high in Paolo, let's say Paolo falls to four, but Paolo is number one on their on their big board. He's falling to four, and you can get to your number one guy by giving up Jeremy and five to get Rashawn Holmes and who's number one on your big board then I think you have to entertain doing that and possibly even doing that. If that's not the case, though, I don't think the Pistons should trade Jeremy and five. I don't think that would make sense. Uh, I don't think they should even entertain packaging those picks. I think the Pistons should be trying to trade Jeremy Grant for another lottery pick somewhere, either that's seven, whether that's 12, 
wherever. They should be trying to get another lottery pick for Jeremy Grant. I think they I, – I, I'm trending towards thinking they're going to get that deal done with Portland for number seven. But that's where I stand with that. Only way you entertain moving up is if one of those three guys drop and the, one of the, the guy who does drop is very high on the Pistons big board, then you entertain it. So – Let's get to the next question. This one's from Scotty B is no Cade. I love that. That's funny. Uh, it says, if we take Ben Math, oh Benedict Matherin, instead of Ivy or Sharp, how likely do you think we have another Kennard versus Steve Mitchell situation? So I don't know. I, I feel like you could possibly have that situation with whoever you draft. If you anytime the Pistons draft anyone who if they're okay, but then someone drafted after them was really good, it doesn't matter. You're going to get that kind of debate at whoever. So you could be with Ivy, and then Sharp turns out to be a demon. Now you have the same thing. If you draft Sharp, and then ben, Benedict Matherin turns out to be a demon, you have the same situation. If you take ben, uh, Benedict Matherin, and Keegan Murray turns out to be a demon, then you have the same situation. So it's not just ben, Benedict Matherin. I, I want to single out to him. It's literally anybody the Pistons pick. If someone after them becomes better than them or is like a demon, you're going to have that debate in, in that situation immediately. It's just, this is how it works. So, um, I, yeah, I, I don't think it's just specific to Bandic math. It's just, that's what's going to happen if you don't get the best pick there. Um, this one's from Chico on Twitter. It says, what do you think about going after Montrez Harrell for the second unit? If we could get him for a good price, not interested in Montrez. Uh, if you want me to be honest, um, I don't think he's that much of a lob threat. He's he's good offensively. He's definitely a nice scorer interior wise. Uh, he can he can you know get his own shot down low. Aggressive player. Um, and something with Harold that I see a lot of Pistons fans have like confused. To my understanding, and I'm pretty I'm like ninety nine point nine percent confident in this understanding and analysis. Montrez Harold is not a good defender at all. Like he's not a good one, and a lot of Pistons fans think. Like I've seen a lot of Pistons fans tweet me and say, "Oh, Montrezl Harrell is like the you know the younger Ben Wallace." He's not. I, I like I I don't know why people think that he's like this great player on defense. He was literally like played off the floor when he was with the Clippers. Clippers had to sit him for like entire series because he was unplayable defensively. So I don't know where that like misunderstanding or like that 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 narrative came from that Montrezl Harrell is like a good defender player, a defensive player. He's not. Um, so I would not be interested in him. I'm, I'd be more interested in, I've said this to you guys a few times, JaVale McGee, um, Andre Drummond. I'd be interested in Andre coming back as a backup. Um, yeah, I, I think JaVale McGee would be a really nice pickup. Mo Bamba. Mo Bamba is another guy I think would, I would really like. Guys like that. I'd, I'd rather go after those dudes at the big man position than Montrez Harrell. I'm not, I'm not I'm not too big of a fan of Montrez Harrell, even though he's a good offensive player. Not not that big of a fan of his. I have some other guys I think the Pistons should go after. That would make more sense. Um, and this is the last question we'll answer. Then we'll go to the ad break and come back and answer some more. This one's from Andrew Cohn. He says, based on his track record, what characteristics, characteristics my God, do you think make a quote-unquote Troy Weaver guy? Um, I think it's very clear at this point. I think it's, I think it's really clear. And it's not even about the player, the type of player. It's a good person, a good human being, um, good in the locker room, nice leader, good work ethic, not about themselves, about the team. Genu- generally, I think you're looking at like a – actually, I won't say that. I was going to say like a quiet guy, but Isaiah Stewart definitely isn't quiet. But more of like a not – not an all about myself kind of guy, you know, not not like an idol or super super model type superstar type of thing. You know, even Kate. Kate's gonna be a superstar, but he's not like about himself. He's not, you know, he's very relaxed, he's very chill, he's about the team, he's not really flamboyant out there. He's like he's not he's, he's not out there. So I think those kind of guys, hard workers who are good human beings and would be like good in the locker room, that kind of thing. Like, I, I think it's very – like Keegan Murray, I think, is obviously – I think he very much fits, like, exactly what Ke- uh, Troy Weaver likes. And like, everything I'm hearing about Keegan Murray, he I feel like he's just – he really is just like the perfect Troy Weaver guy, in my opinion. Like, a guy who plays the right way, too, doesn't try too too much stuff, do things he's not like, – he can't do, knows how to play, does the right thing, doesn't try fancy stuff, like, that kind of thing. I, I think that's the Troy Weaver guy. Some people may disagree, but that's my – that's like – that's how like I've come away with, and people would point to like Russell Westbrook and his Thunder days, but I'm talking about like with the Pistons thus far. Like that's what I've gotten from his type of dude, um, and we'll see if that that if I'm wrong with that. But that's that's what I've come away with, like that. And that's not even talking about like on court type of guy. 
Um, I think he'll obviously just take the best player available. He, like, it doesn't matter what kind of player you are on the court. Like, off the court, I think that stuff matters a lot to them. And those th- that's those are some of the things I think they really look forward to getting out of a player that they're going to draft. Um, when we come back, we'll answer the rest of your guys' questions for this episode of The Mailbag. But first, I have to tell you guys about another one of our sponsors. This one, let me tell you a little bit about Truebill. Do you know why free trials renew without your consent? Is a business scam out to get you. Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take control of your subscriptions. Truebill is a new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill makes it incredibly simple. Just link your account and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in just one tap. And your Truebill concert is there when you need them to cancel unwanted subscriptions so you don't have to. Truebill has over 2 million users and have helped them save over $100 million. And like Matthew B., who says, quote, In a matter of seconds, I saved $660 a year on my DirecTV bill, saved $120 for the year on my Sirius XM bill, and saved $840 a year on my car insurance, end quote. So don't fall for the subscription scams. Start canceling the day at Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. Go right now. Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. It can save you thousands a year. That's Truebill.com slash LockedOnNBA. So I want to thank you guys again for making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. And if you haven't already, have the YouTube channel at Lockdown Pistons. Hit that subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it. Um, before I answer any more questions, man, people on Twitter start acting weird about this. I really don't get what was going on on Twitter. But, bro, I hooped this past weekend at my, you know, at my high school. We'd be having runs up there. There was a dude who came up. You know, some dudes, like, posted on their Snapchat whatever, and we have, like, a bunch of random guys come up. Uh, usually get really good runs. We get some D2 guys coming up there. We had Romeo Weems. You guys know who he, he went to. I, what, what DePaul. He went to DePaul and was on the Memphis Grizzly G League team. He he comes up there every now and then. So, anyways, we had, like, a, a bunch of random people come up, some really good hoopers pull up. And one dude walked through, and I kid you not, I, everyone in the gym thought this was Cade Cunningham. I, I swear to you guys right now, this dude looked just like Cade. He was like 6'5". His jump shot looked just like Kay Cunningham. His Like the, the goatee with the mustache, like the light skin. Like it looked literally, the hair, like everything looks identical to Kay Cunningham. It was seriously crazy. It was like scary. And everyone in the gym's coming up to me like, dude, is that Kay Cunningham, bro? Like obviously it was a joke. Like we didn't actually think it was Kay Cunningham. But it was like, bro, is that Cade for real? Like, bro, this dude looks just like Kay Cunningham. It was crazy, bro. I kid you guys not. Like it was so it was so weird that like my fiance who was there, she was like snapping pictures like secretly of the dude and kept sending them to me while I was on the court. I come back and look at my phone and she's like, dude, you're playing with K Cunning and blah blah. So that was crazy, man. I had to tell you guys about that because that was the, the dude literally looked I did I feel like he was doing it on purpose though. I think he knows he looks like Cade. So then he started like purposely trying to play like Cade and then shoot like with the same form as Cade. I feel like he was doing it on purpose. I I, I he has to know. But seriously, like the entire gym was coming up to me and like, bro, why is Kate Cunningham here? Why, 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 why is Kate coming here trying to mess up the run? It was weird, bro. It was crazy. He literally looked like a doppelganger, dude. It was wild. Um, but anyways, had to tell you guys that story. I thought that was funny. Twitter didn't think it was funny. Twitter thought I was like trying to flex or something and try stunt or some shit. I, I, Twitter's weird. Uh, anyways, let's go ahead and answer some of these questions. This one's from. First to the party, Lex. It says, Keegan Murray at five. Our starting five is set. Killian ready. Keegan going to be a version of our Corliss Williams, six man. Every championship Pistons team has had a lethal six man from the microwave to Big Nasty. I now see that this wasn't even really a question. You were just like tweeting me like a statement. Um, do I think their starting five? Would, I'll, I'll change it to a question. Do I think their starting five would be set if they got Keegan Murray. I think they would have to trade Jeremy to make room for Keegan Murray in the starting lineup. But yeah, I think that would be fine. Uh, it would be decent. They would have to make some other moves as well. I, I really want them to replace the team option guys with some other dudes to take a chance on. But, yeah, I, I think that would make sense as a starting lineup. Uh, this one's a three-piece question from Be Like Bird. It says, one, what is the best trade scenario for Jeremy Grant to play for a contender? If you're considering Portland a, tro- uh, a contender, I mean, it's Jeremy for seven and like a salary filler or the TPE. Uh, second question, it says, what will it take for Killing Hayes to win most improved next season statistically? 
uh, he'd have to start, which is why I don't think he would even have a chance. Like, I'm sure a lot of people don't think he had a chance anyways because they don't think he's good. But if you're one of those people who think he could take the step skill-wise, he would have to get, like, the opportunity to do so. I don't think he's going to start anyways. So he's not going to be able to rack up the stats to do so. So I really don't think it's even possible. But if I was to, like, build a stat line, I think he would have to start a lot of games and he'd have to average, like, 13, 14 points a game, six, seven assists, and, like, four or five, four rebounds a game with, like, shooting like 43% from the field, 44% from the field, and like 34, 35% from deep, something like that. I think that would give him in consideration most improved player of the year. Um, even though most improved player of the year recently, they're they're like, it's not even about who actually improved from bad to good. It's about, oh, this guy went from great to all of a sudden, now he got an all-star. Let's go ahead and give it to him. Like John Morant winning, winning it was just weird. Like Desmond Bain had a better shot at getting that, probably deserved it over him and he was on his same team so i don't get how they did that i I don't like what they're doing with the most improved board but anyways and then next question is who's the most intriguing player in the draft at the center position jalen duran uh we're going to talk about him at some point on the podcast soon give me a second we will get to him um but we'll we'll talk about him soon but i think that's the most intriguing one uh next one is this one another one from first the party likes it says do you think the pistons should trade jeremy to golden state for james wiseman no, I don't think the Pistons – I don't think Golden State would be interested in that. They seem like they're willing to wait for Wiseman, and it's worked out for them. There's no need for them to move on young guys now. They're in the finals. They can If they can get to the finals and continue to weigh on young guys and develop them, why not? So I don't think they would want to do that. And secondly, Wiseman has a lot of question marks about him. I know he was a high draft pick, so it, like he's considered a blue-chip prospect. But he has a lot of questions, a lot of injuries, and a lot of people didn't think he should have went that high either. So I don't know. I – I would welcome Wiseman, but there's a lot of questions for him, so I get why people would be hesitant with it. Um, next question is: uh, Is the co- <laughs> this per- this is from Austin on Twitter? He says, "Is the coach holding us back?" <laughs> no, Dwayne Casey's not holding the team back yet. I don't think he's the coach for the team when they're like trying to compete, but definitely co- Dwayne Casey isn't the reason why the Pistons were tanking. They were tanking because they were trying to get a top pick. So no. Um, Next question is from Jay on Twitter. Do you trust Shaden Sharp? I want Ivy or Murray. So you guys know, I, I, I'm all the way in on Shaden Sharp. I think he should be the pick. Um, from the videos I've watched, the scouting reports I've watched, from the people we talked to last week about Shaden Sharp, uh, from everything I've seen about him, I, I be, I'm a believer in him. I think he's going to be a really damn good player. I get the risk. I understand there is risk. I understand the lack of college tape makes it hard. And I understand that looking at some of the tape that he has from EYBL in high school, it's hard to tell what's going to translate. It's hard to tell what actually will and what actually is something you can, you know, pull away. I think from what I've seen, there's a play. By the way, there's been plenty of players who have been pulled from high school and drafted. Like there's been 41 players who have been drafted from high school. And a lot of them turned out to be good, great superstar players. A lot of them turned out to be really nice players, long career type players. So this idea that just because you went to high school, you didn't go to college all of a sudden, oh God, you're some, you're, you're some big risk that we don't know anything about. I, NBA history doesn't prove that. Like, there's been a lot of players drafted out of high school. You can tell. There's, people like us probably can't scout co- high school people and be able to tell, but the scouts get paid to do that. It's harder, but they can do that. And it's happened a lot in NBA history. And a lot of those guys either wanted to be superstars, stars, all-stars, or long-term players. Obviously, there's been some misses, but there's been a lot of hits too. So I don't necessarily agree with the fact that just because he didn't play in college means he's like this completely unknown. Like, he was number one coming out of high school. And I'm not saying that, like, all number one high school prospects turn into great players. That's not what I'm saying. But it's not like this dude was, like, a number 20 high school prospect, didn't play college, and now all of a sudden shooting people, shooting up people's boards out of nowhere. Like, this dude was look, was heavily looked at since high school. Doesn't mean it will translate. Doesn't mean he will be great. But he's not coming out of nowhere. I guess I, I, don't, I, I don't agree with that. Um, so... But in the end, yes, that was a little bit of a rant. But yeah, I'm 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 in on Shane and Sharp. I trust him. Um, this question's from I, I don't know how to pronounce it, Asuka Truly. It uh, says, Do you believe a Cade and Jay and Ivy backcourt would be the best for us going forward? Or would you rather prefer Sharp, even though we have little little to no tape on him? I would prefer Shane Sharp. I don't think we don't have any tape on him. It's just tape that a lot of people don't like. It's not it's it's tape that a lot of casuals and a lot of people like us, including myself can't scout and can't pull away from. So like the high school and EYBL tape is enough for a lot of scouts to be able to pull stuff away and know and ha- and feel confidence. The ones that don't feel confident won't draft them, but a lot of scouts will be able to pull stuff away and will draft them and be confident in him. So I, I, I don't really believe that he doesn't have any tape. 
also I the Ivy fit. I don't know. I, th- I it's I, I don't think it's an awful fit, but I don't think it's the most seamless fit either. But if he's there, he probably will be the best player available on how, depending on how you feel on Shane Sharp, and they should draft best player available no matter what. So I'm not going to say he is or isn't a best fit. I just think they should draft him then if he's at five. If, if Jane Ivy falls to five and you're not picking Shane Sharp, pick Jane Ivy. He's the best player available. Get him. That, that's where I'm at with it. So that's all the questions for today's episode of the Mailbag Podcast. Thank you guys for sending all of you guys' questions. You want to be on next week's episode, go to the comment section down below or over on Twitter at Kuka Hill or even at the Lockdown Pistons Twitter at Lockdown Pistons. Put hashtag mailbag, ask the question, and I'll try to get you guys on next week's episode. Thank you guys for listening today, making Lockdown Pistons your first listen of every single day. We are free and available on all your podcast platforms. Make sure you're making Lockdown NBA your second listen of every single day. From the first jump ball to play in tournament to the last possession of the finals, Lockdown experts take you deep inside the playoffs with inside analysis affecting all 30 teams. Golden State Warriors are in the finals. I'm going for the Golden State Warriors. Let me know who you guys are going for. Actually, by the time you guys listen to this, it will be on Sunday morning. So we have a game seven that we have to watch. I'm going to go ahead and pick the Heat. I think the Heat pulled it off, man. They were doubted. I, they're back home in Miami. I think they pulled it off. I, th- I think they upset the Boston Celtics. But I'm going for the, the Warriors to win it all. Um, but that's all I've got for you guys today, man. Thank you for listening. Thank you guys for showing out the past like week and a half, man. This is like the best. We haven't got these type of numbers on the podcast in my entire time. Now, we broke the record for a week and a month, I believe in February. And we've slowly sted, slowly but surely, you know, grown, grown, gotten better, gotten better. The fan base is growing. You know, we're showing strong. But this past week, man, you guys absolutely went bonkers, dude. And we are showing ourselves to be the best fan base at the Lockdown Network. I appreciate you guys for supporting the channel, supporting the podcast, supporting me as a host. I love interacting with all you guys. I love doing this for you guys. So just really want to thank you guys again for showing out for us, man. This is this was dope. And I, I love getting I, I love seeing the Pistons community and our fan base specifically, the Lockdown Pistons fan base, getting credit at the Lockdown Network and being noticed amongst everybody because we are the best ones out there. Again, I appreciate you guys. But until the next one, I'll see you guys later. Enjoy this game seven tonight. Let me know who you guys are going for. Until the next one, I'll see you guys later. Peace out, everybody.